Ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening to you all and a very warm welcome to our last Med Talk for the year 2021. Throughout this year, we've had several talks on COVID-19, its various iteration and progression. And once again, we find ourselves at a crossroad with this new variant. There have been several requests for us to have such a talk about this new variant, Omicron, and what it means for us as a country, also as a university, and as with, as with regards to vaccine efficacy. As always, today's talk would be followed by a Q&A, and we would start off with some questions which we fielded in from our registration form, and then open the floor for questions from the audience. Our speaker this evening, Professor Suranjit Seniviratna, is currently at the Institute of Immunology and Transplantation at the Royal Free Hospital and the University College London and Health Services Laboratory, London, UK. He completed his basic medical degree at the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Colombo with first class honours, eight distinctions and 10 gold medals and was placed first in his year. He completed his MD in internal medicine and trained in clinical immunology and allergy at the John Radcliffe Hospital in Oxford. He, he has published a number of papers and authored 264 journal publication and has an H index of 43. Currently, he serves as one of the best clinical medicine researchers in Sri Lanka and has published in journals such as Nature, Science and Nature Medicine, Blood, Journal of Medical Genetics, American Journal of Human Genetics and Journal of Experimental Medicine. He's a director for the Center of Mast Cell Disorders and the president of the UK Sri Lanka Immunology Foundation, an organization that contributes to immunology and allergy education in Sri Lanka. We are honored to have him with us this evening. Without further ado, I would now like to invite Professor Seniviratna for his talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tisura, for the invitation to speak at this. Uh session and also thank you to all the committee members uh, of the uh, clinical uh, society, uh, the student society that uh, you all have, the clinical society. And let me first start off with sharing my slides and then uh, starting the talk, just if I can. Just give me a second to share the slides and put Excellent. So what I will do is give you some flavor of how immunology has, is leading the way, global battle to survive the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. Now I know this is a society for medical students uh, to know about uh, new and current things in the world. And what I will start off with telling you a little bit about myself and immunology. So the timeline, looking at how I fell into immunology just by accident. Initially, it was during school time, it was cricket, cricket and more cricket. It was always just, it was four day a week because Friday and Saturday was playing cricket and sat, Sunday was resting. Then I went to the university we were closed for three years. So another hurdle came in there, had to do a different career and finish that and then back into university. Then I wanted to be an academic in the university. And at that time, they were told they are not interested in those who cannot do research. So that was another stumbling block. I finished my postgraduate studies, got a scholarship to the University of Oxford and accidentally fell into immunology. So that was a pathway just to show you that there have been quite a lot of stumbling blocks along the way. It was just not from the time I was born, I wanted to be an immunologist. I just accidentally fell into this field. And often there is this term immunology. What's that? What does it mean? And I tried those days, I used to try to explain it as, some kind of logic. So it is studying something and the immune system. But people could understand allergy well, 
But when we talk about immunology, people were really not certain what that meant. We all know about infectious disease consultants, they deal with infectious diseases, respiratory physicians, cardiologists, surgeons, etc. But this pandemic has brought in some other people into the fold. Among them, immunologists, leading with the virologists, epidemiologists. Many people had, didn't know what an epidemiologist would have done previously, and modelers. The only thing the people previously remembered modelers, mod, uh, modeling was, you know, on the catwalk, mo modelers. What are modelers doing? These are infectious disease modelers. So these people have worked as a team and come to the fore with the other specialists to be able to handle this pandemic and try to keep the world safe. And that's where the immunologists are at the lead in front of this pandemic. There are three different areas of immunology, clinical immunology, where you deal with patients and also deal with diagnostics and research, like what I do. There are research immunologists who go through a PhD and do a lot of basic science and very advanced research. And there are diagnostic immunologists who are trained to run labs and do very, very complex immunology tests. So these are the different types of immunologists. And I just give you a flavor of what immunology is and how I came to be doing immunology through a very circuitous route of falling into it by accident. So what we are we dealing with? This virus with spike proteins on the surface that binds to the cell, enters the cell, divides in the cell, multiplies in the cell, and then spreads from person to person and cell to cell. This is the nasty virus, SARS-CoV-2, which causes COVID-19. So many millions have got COVID-19, 270 million in the world, with more than 5.73 million deaths around the world. The UK, the US, Brazil, India have been really affected by this pandemic, both in cases and in deaths. Sri Lanka was safeguarded during the initial part, and then around April, there was an increasing number of cases, and we have to be careful because Omicron is circulating around the world. It's coming to Sri Lanka, it will spread around the world and most likely become the dominant strain around the world. In the UK, it's doubling at two to three days the amount of cases. I'll talk a little bit about Omicron going on. Published a lot of papers on this area. Some of this is just a, just a snapshot of the papers. And what I will talk about, all those papers can be read because they are freely uh, available if needed for any student. I will touch on these areas as a summary. The immune response, variants, including the Omicron variant, and talk about vaccination, which is an important goal that we are striving for to vaccinate people together with public health measures, antivirals, and monoclonal antibodies. And just one slide on long COVID, which is becoming a big problem around the world. So if you look at the immune response, this is a slide I often use. You have viruses, bacteria, fungi trying to affect our body. You have the innate immune system and the adaptive immune system that tries to fight those organisms and keep those at bay. You have antibodies, white cells, that does this function. If those components are not working well, you would get immunodeficiency. That is underactive the immune system. If those components are working in a abnormal way, a dysregulated way. You get autoimmunity, where the immune system is attacking your own body. You get allergy. Some people get cancers, etc. So those are two different parts of the immune system. We have to safeguard that the immune system to keep us healthy. Cytokines are the chemicals that are used for the immune cells to talk to each other. And we have to keep the cytokines at a specific level because if it's too high, you'll get hypercytokinemia. If, and if it's too low, you can get certain diseases. You have antibody responses, which come the IgM response, the IgG response, 
and those come after a few days and that is why it takes some time for the immune response to develop after you see an organism so if you try to wait for that response to develop people can die in the intervening period that is where vaccination has come to have the immune response already there when the organism is met you have cd4 cells you have cd8 cells so antibodies you have cellular and that cd4 and cd8 cells you know that different immunopathogenic changes occurred in covid you had certain cells increasing like neutrophils certain cells were reduced like lymphocytes and platelets cytokines were increased certain cytokines the hypocytokinemia and the very high levels of certain chemicals were increasing in the blood and causing lung damage and that what has happened here yeah this shows the, what happens in immune response you we find the innate immune response come in initially and then it goes down and then the antibodies and t cells come in on board and increase in to get rid of the virus as you can see there in black the viral load reducing that's at the top figure and in a patient with sars cov2 or co infection or cov you find that the viral load increases t cells are not working properly antibodies increase but are not very effective and then you find the innate immune system is defective with a lot of cytokines so we have i've given quite a number of talks before and these are all available for any one of you all to listen to what's the cytokine storm in covid-19 and what you would know is that certain chemicals are increasing including il6 and this goes in a real sort of tornado type leading to damage to the lung and multi organ failure with death it's important to know the pathogenesis because by knowing the pathogenesis we can target certain treatment and you know the treatment guidance that was given for people who had sars cov2 if you go into hospital steroids was indicated in a specific group not if you don't not if you are at home that's very important and antibiotics should not be used indiscriminately because this is a viral infection not a bacterial infection so this is all learned by knowing the pathogenesis of when to use steroids dexamethasone etc then we came into the area certain cytokines were increased tocilizumab was increased for covid sorry il6 was increased in covid-19 and tocilizumab the il6 blocker was used and this was what was happening if il6 was increasing it was signaling in the cell and causing of the damage and if you use this in the correct circumstance you could reduce the complications and death from covid so all this was done by immunologist and virologist working in concert with the other specialties to be able to get drugs for this condition monoclonal antibodies was the next important advance because certain times if the person is not vaccinated or, or has not made a response to vaccination you want something that can be given quite early especially in immune deficient patient we have monoclonal antibodies is like passive immunization we have monoclonal antibodies which you can give the patient early in the course and then together with antiviral agents oral antiviral agents which have come into uh, play now especially in the immune deficient patient but it should be given early so i told you there are four things public health measures vaccination monoclonal antibodies and antiviral agents that are important in dealing this with this pandemic and immunology comes in right at the interface of getting these different things out to the patient what about the variants what many organisms when they multiply they mutate rna viruses mutate far more than the dna viruses influenza and hiv mutate a lot compared to sars cov2 but we have spoken a lot about the mutations in the sars cov2 virus and the significant mutations alpha beta gamma delta which are called the variants of concern by the who and the variants of interest as given in this slide why how do we classify them we classify them if this if it has an effect on spread or severe disease diagnostic test therapeutic agents or vaccine response if it affects one of those five or two of those five or three of those five then it 
can go into the category of variant of concern. And we know that there are five variants of concern at the moment. There were four, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and then we had the Omicron variant come in directly as a variant of con concern, just classified and designated. Again, much has been written about the variants. These were the initial description of the variant, the vaccine responses against the variants, the Delta variant, the Delta Plus variant, the Mu variant, the Lambda variant, and finally, lots of articles again about the Omicron variant, which has been going around. And every week you have a new thing coming. Again, there's quite a lot of new information in the last week, which we can discuss when we have our question. And that's important because the Omicron variant is going around the world and it will affect most countries and we have to be ready for that with the four things that I mentioned. So next we come on to the vaccines, some basic aspects of the vaccines. What are they? What are the vaccines available? The immune responses, etc. Eight vaccines have been approved, eight have been rejected. So not every vaccine that got into development was taken to final develop, uh, was approved. Some were rejected, but eight have been approved and many, many other vaccines are in development at the moment. And that's great because we will have so many other uh, parts of the arsenal that we would need in the future. So these are the common vaccines that have been approved. The mRNA vaccines, the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine, the viral vector vaccines, AstraZeneca, the J&J uh, &J and the Sputnik vaccine and the killed vaccines, that is the Sinopharm and Sinovac vaccine. These are different characteristics, different storage temperatures, different uh, uh, eff efficacy figures, etc., and different costs, which I've dealt with in many, many previous talks in the past. So it is directed against all the present vaccines are directed against a spike protein that is found on the surface of the cell. And this was a vaccine landscape as we had written some, week, some months ago. So you have vaccine efficacy, which are the clinical trial, but that alone is not sufficient. We have to look at vaccine effectiveness. That is the real world data. Does it work? And we have seen that the vaccines do work in this real world where it reduced the number of severe infections, ICU care, deaths, and hospitalized. That was the most important thing because infection, mild infection, not the most important. It is the other readouts, the most severe readouts that is important. Even in the UK, you can find that in November, the num last November, the number of cases were increasing. The vaccines came in from December and it the curve, the number of cases and severe cases, hospitalization, et cetera, reduced very, very rapidly. So vaccination has been used around the world. Many countries have vaccinated a fair proportion of their population. Sri Lanka is going full steam, but there are some countries that are lagging behind. Nigeria, Pakistan, you can see these countries, and they are not vaccinating sufficient amounts of their population. And the danger of that is if the world thinks that only they are being safe is fine, that would not work because a variant will arise, as we saw from Southern Africa, a variant will arise and then spread to other parts of the world and can put the whole program in danger. And that is why everyone needs to be protected and it can't be piecemeal protection, which one country giving six doses of vaccine and the other country not even having access to even one dose. And you can see the number of countries that even has not even received one dose of the vaccine. And that is not a good equitable process. And the WHO is speaking a lot about that to correct it. So we know that we have a range of vaccines. And if we quickly look at the immune response to the vaccines, which I've again touched in, in several previous talks, looking at the immune aspect, we know that you have to have two vaccines. This was initially, now it seems that you have to have three vaccines on board, because if you have one vaccine, the immune response is insufficient and you had to have second vaccine. And that was why there was a problem when the AstraZeneca second dose was being delayed and people were saying one vaccine is sufficient. No, that is not so. You have to have two vaccines. And the neutralization, the antibody neutralization of vaccines varied. It was better against certain, uh, certain variants, but it was lower against certain other variants, like the beta variant, which de developed 
yeah, which was noted in South Africa some time ago. And that was an important finding from the immune aspect. And this was an important study where they showed that the AstraZeneca vaccine was not effective against a beta variant and the country stopped using the AstraZeneca vaccine because they had a lot of beta variants circulating at that time, that is South Africa. So again, immunology was at the forefront of working out these important policy decisions with regards to vaccination, et cetera. What about mixing vaccines? Another common topic that people have been asking lots of questions about. I have done several talks on this, which you can listen at different stages, including one very recently. So what are we doing with mixing mix vaccine? That is, you can either get AstraZeneca, AstraZeneca, or you can get AstraZeneca, Pfizer, or you can get Pfizer, AstraZeneca. The first one is uh, homologous. The second two are heterologous, heterologous because it is one vaccine and then mixed with another vaccine. And when it comes to the booster vaccines, you can find that is what has been done now. You get two, say, Sinopharm vaccines, and now you've been told to go and get the Pfizer vaccine. So Sinopharm first of AstraZeneca first, and now the Pfizer vaccine. So people have been asking about, is that safe? Is that effective, et cetera? And these were the sort of, this talk was very early because of the question that came up with AstraZeneca being delayed for some time, et cetera. Can they combine with some other vaccine? Then I did a part two again a few months after that. And then very recently, I gave this talk where I spoke about COVID vaccine, the science of mixing vaccines and booster doses, which was again at the... Column medical faculty uh, sessions. So the bottom line here is real world evidence supports. There's real world evidence supporting the safety and immunogenicity of heterologous, that is a combination, AstraZeneca, Pfizer. AstraZeneca first, Pfizer second, because the immune response is better, it's safe, and this is where the third dose is coming with a mRNA vaccine, either Pfizer or the Moderna vaccine. And that is the important take home message that we got from different immune tests. Again, you find that using heterologous uh, protocol that is using different vaccine, you can, especially AstraZeneca and Pfizer, you can get better neutralization against a beta variant, which was a tricky variant initially, as shown in this slide. Next, we come on to patients with cancer and immunization, that the patients that I deal with, especially immune deficient patients, very important group when it comes to SARS-CoV-2, because immune deficiency is not that only that they're born with it, but they, lots of people receive steroids and other immunosuppressive medication for the primary condition they have. So again, when it comes to cancer and COVID-19, a lot has been written, spoken about this. And the important thing is that there was 20%, expect 20% rise in cancer deaths in England due to the COVID-19 emergency because they were not having their follow-up, not getting their treatment. They were, if they get COVID, they were getting more severe disease, high chance of getting COVID. And this has been written about quite extensively. So what is the take-home message of that? We found that. The take-home message is cancer patients should be receiving the COVID-19 vaccine very early. And they should be receiving three doses of the COVID vaccine as the primary course, not two doses, three doses. So three Pfizer doses or three AstraZeneca doses, not two. That's very important to remember. This was an article written about COVID-19 in cancer and in uh, vaccinating them. And this will deal with the three dose regime that is given. So a third dose was recommended quite early in immune deficient patient as a primary course. This is not booster, this is a third dose in primary in immune deficient patient because they needed three doses which equivalent to two doses in a healthy control person. Again, in solid organ transplant, if you didn't make a good response with two doses, they found that certain percentage made a good response with the third dose. And that is why renal transplant patient plus uh, liver transplant patient, et cetera, were advised to get three doses and cancer patient as a primary course. HIV, important in certain countries, especially in Africa, and with regards to vaccination, et cetera, just a few days ago, I gave this immunology, HIV, and COVID, and the combination, and about vaccination. And the important take-home message from that is the advances we made in COVID 
could have a positive impact on HIV and getting a vaccine. Because for the last 40 years, we have not had a vaccine in HIV. While in COVID, we were able to, uh, for COVID, we were able to get a vaccine in about 12 months. So that is an important fact to remember. mRNA vaccines are being tested at the moment in HIV and an important medical advance that the COVID pandemic and vaccine development has, has produced. So I've spoken about immune responses, vaccine vaccines, cancer and immune deficiency. I'll talk about booster vaccine because many of you all have been given this booster vaccine at the moment in Sri Lanka. And what do you mean by booster vaccine given at a to boost immune response? Why was this needed? Because Pfizer quite early said months. And they said, okay, at about six months, you may need a booster. Another study, many studies showed this. I've just selected two studies. And AstraZeneca. Boosters were introduced very early in, in, in uh, Israel. And it is effective. It is safe. It is rapidly. And then you can see after the boosters were introduced, the cases reduced and and it reduced hospitalization, death, uh, plus severe disease in this group of patients. And this study that was published quite recent. So boosters are safe and effective. The COVID study came up in the UK, which has been published. Again, they found if the mRNA vaccine that should be used because that gives the best immune response in a patient. one month ago, but then things changed. Number of cases increased with Omicron, etc. It was reduced to 40, it was reduced. Now it has been reduced to 18 years. So if all adults are being offered a booster and the time period has been reduced from six months to three months. So now the booster is at three months after the second dose and it is for all over the age of 18. That is because the Omicron variant has come and it is spreading all over the world. So as a summary, COVID-19 vaccine boosters are effective and safe. Again, we have reviewed this in great detail. Any of you could read it and get the information from as we are updated because one thing with COVID is things do move very rapidly as, as uh, the weeks go by. At that time, it was six months. Now it is three months, and it, but still the vaccine is uh, of mRNA vaccine, Pfizer or, or Moderna, and it should be, and it is 18 years and above. They're also thinking about boosting uh, children, you know, boosted children. So we'll next, we'll come about vaccination in children. Again, lots have been written about vaccination children and, and pregnancy uh, as two different groups. Children are being vaccinated now around the world, certain age groups, different countries have different age groups that are vaccinating, but this has been widespread because children, although they don't get severe COVID, as more and more other people get vaccinated, you find that they become non-vaccinated. They, they, they are an unvaccinated population and then a group of them can get COVID and not have schooling, etc. So it was decided that children should be vaccinated and at Currently, they have been received the vaccine at different, uh, according to different protocols in different countries. Finally, you have this process of long COVID coming. That is, again, that is one reason why children have been suggested to get a vaccine because once you get COVID, that's immune dysregulation, and that immune dysregulation can go on for many weeks or months. And people are presenting now across the board to respiratory physicians, to cardiologists, to neurologists, to gastroenterologists, to allergists, immunologists with a condition called long COVID. And many students, many young doctors, patients, etc., know about this. But they'll be expected to, especially the doctors and medical personnel, etc., would be expected to treat this condition and refer them to the appropriate persons to get proper treatment that is needed for this condition. 
And this is again some article that was written about long COVID quite recently, if any of you all want, read the different aspects for long COVID. It is changing, newer things are coming in and the immune response findings are being generated as we speak. So what I've done in this talk was told you about the immune response to COVID, SARS-CoV-2 infection, the variants, especially the Omicron variant, and I'm very happy to ask questions. We have written a lot of articles during the last two weeks and uh, another one is coming at the end of this week. Spoken to you about COVID-19 vaccinations, including the immune response, and told you that two vaccines, now it appears that you should have three vaccines because that is needed for proper immune response against Omicron. Told you about mixing is allowed and mixing is, more, is beneficial now with the mRNA vaccine. Cancer and immune deficient patient, booster doses, and I told you when the booster is given, in different countries at the moment, children have been vaccinated. And I also touched about long COVID because that's an important condition that all of us will have to, we are dealing with it now at the moment in the UK and other many, many person would have to deal with this as the months go by. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Professor Suranjit for that very uh, insightful talk and for sharing his own experiences uh, working at the forefront uh, as um, a, a consultant immunologist, uh, a specialist uh, in the field of uh, immunology. Uh, and uh, with that, we will now be moving on to uh, the, uh, the Q&A session. Uh, and, uh, in uh, this particular session, uh, we will be first taking uh, the questions which have been posed by our participants on the registration form. And uh, then we will be opening the floor uh, for all other participants to uh, pose their questions. Uh, so, uh, so we will now be moving on to uh, the questions which have already been uh, sent to us by uh, our participants. Uh, so our first question for today is regarding uh, the immune response uh, which occurs in breakthrough infections uh, in those who are considered to be fully or uh, incompletely vaccinated. Uh, so, so if you could just um, uh, maybe comment on uh, the kind of uh, the, the immune response uh, that uh, sort of uh, occurs uh, in the case of breakthrough infections. Um, Okay, shall I try? Uh, shall I attempt that question? Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Yeah, right. So, so now you get a you get two vaccines. You get a vaccine. You get antibody uh, antibody levels increasing IgG IgM antibodies. You have binding antibodies, neutralizing antibodies. Then you have T cells, CD four cells, CD eight cells. You get the second dose as we second dose. We go at first dose, second dose, etc. You get the second dose and you have the antibody levels increasing. You have the T cell responses increasing. And in certain persons, you find that when you get an infection, that immune response is not sufficient to prevent infection. So the person can get infected with the virus. That is infection. So immune risk, but the, what the immune response will do is prevent severe disease. And that's what we want from the vaccine. So the important thing there is infection. Some people who are infected can develop mild disease, others moderate disease, others severe disease. And those we want to prevent severe disease, hospitalization, and death. So what vaccines are very good in doing is preventing the hospitalization, severe disease, and death. So when you get a breakthrough infection, it means people who have been having immune response with the vaccination, they get the viral infection. They have not been able to prevent infection. They get a mild infection. And that was not the big problem because the problem for the world and different countries is if people keep on getting to hospital. Uh, with because it overwhelms the system and it overwhelms other parts of the system, such as people with cardiac disease, cancers, kidney diseases, other uh, important uh, long-term illnesses, because they can't go to hospital, they can't get the treatment they need. So that is why vaccination is great, 
But then with the new variants coming in, you find that the two vaccines alone, there's a 40% drop in neutralization with the Omicron variant. 25 to 40%. That is what the South Africans found, the Durban study. That was confirmed with the other studies that came out. So therefore, but when they looked at the booster vaccine, they found that again, it came back to baseline to standard level. So that is why the UK now is rushing to get the booster vaccines through. Yesterday, the Prime Minister, or today, the Prime Minister informed that everyone over the age of 18 would be offered a booster vaccine by 31st December. First, it was January, etc., because we have found that the Omicron variant is not neutralized to the same level as the Delta. So two vaccines were sufficient for Delta. Three vaccines are needed for Omicron. And it is not only vaccination. Please remember, everyone must remember that. It is public health measures, not meeting lots of people in you know uh, unprotected uh, environments without masks, etc. Number two, uh, it is vaccination. Number three, antiviral agents, other medicines plus monoclonal antibodies. So it's a combined issue. That is, don't only think vaccination and everything is fine. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you for that uh, comprehensive uh, answer. Uh, so I think we have already spoken about um, immunocompromised uh, patients. Uh, sir, uh, this question is uh, regarding yet another important uh, cohort of uh, individuals. So uh, this question is regarding uh, hypersensitivity or people with uh, known allergies. So uh, this person, uh, the participant wants to know uh, your insights regarding uh, the risk are the risks and uh, whether the risks outweigh uh, the benefits uh, for those who have who uh, have known uh, multiple or severe allergies and the sort of impact uh, uh, the sort of impact of taking uh, the whole cocktail of COVID vaccines uh, in these individuals. So, uh, if you could uh, maybe tell us a bit more on that, sir. Very, very good question. I think uh, because this has been a question that has been there for the past one year. I mean, when we started vaccination in December 2020, as allergies immunologists, this was a question that we were answering regularly, almost on a day-to-day -day basis. We have to remember that we are dealing with a nasty illness that can kill COVID. We are not dealing with a sort of a cold and trying to prevent a cold or something like that. We are dealing with, so it is like a person trying to cross the road. A lorry is coming down to down the road and they can knock them and person and people are interested in something that may come, they drop from a plane that is flying above and come and knock them, uh, 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 come and strike their head. So the important thing is the lorry is like COVID. You know, that is the problem. That is the danger. You get COVID. Many people will get very severe, a fair proportion will get very severe disease. Some people will die and the long-term complication that can occur from COVID. So vaccines, any medicine can cause hypersensitive reactions. Any medicines, even water, if you, they've done a study where they gave people a blinded fashion, even water and it's through suggestion, people started fainting, et cetera, when getting plain water. So any medicine, we know that adverse effects and certain reactivity can occur. Always you want to balance and see that the benefit from a, whatever you give is outweighs many, many times the harm that can occur. So as doctors, we are always taught, do no harm. So when we look at COVID at one side, and some of the reactivity that can occur, the minor reactivity that can occur in certain people, the benefit from preventing COVID and not getting COVID is far more, many, many hundred times more than the hypersensitivity reactions. And we have to remember, again, hypersensitivity is a broad area. Hypersensitivity, you know, increased sensitivity. There are different types of hypersensitivity. IgE immediate type hypersensitivity is type 1, and that is via the allergic pathway. So there are several other types of hypersensitivity, which we are not on type 4, etc. So the important thing to remember is many, many people in the West have allergies, severe allergies, especially peanut allergy, etc. Practically, 
big proportion of them have received the vaccine without any issue. There have been a few allergic reactions with uh, hypersensitive reaction with Pfizer and Moderna, but those were very uncommon compared to the damage that can occur from COVID, getting COVID. So even the allergy patients, all are protected, all allergy patients have been able to get some type of COVID vaccine and be protected. Thank you, sir. Uh, so we have got uh, we have got several questions uh, regarding um, uh, the, the vaccine efficacy on the Omicron variant and the importance of getting uh, the third booster dose. Uh, but sir, I would now like to uh, ask this question, which is not really um, COVID related, uh, but a uh, participant wants to uh, know your insights regarding um, bioinformatics uh, and its place in future research in immunology. Uh, so, uh, okay, uh, very, of, very good. I mean, I mean, if you're if you're good in maths, I mean, we are from a different generation. So we grew up without phones. We grew up without uh, without many of the things initially to save data. Uh, that we use. So therefore, we were not really exposed to the bioinformatics, except I know at my PhD, I learned some bioinformatics and while working with uh, great interest in, in research. But if you're good in mathematics and if you're good, I mean, if you're good at uh, sort of analytical techniques and uh, IT, et cetera, and you have an interest in uh, biology, bioinformatics is the field to go into, wonderful field, you can do so much sitting at your desk. You can analyze so much. You don't have to. Uh, so it is a wonderful field to be uh, involved in, and it will go across the range of uh, uh, specialties. You can be a bioinformatician dealing with uh, analyzing genes and uh, pathways, uh, uh, etc. In cardiology, neurology, etc. So bioinformatics is a top field, especially if you have those skills. It is absolutely the problem that is happening is a lot of our bioinformaticians are getting very highly paid jobs in finance and in private sector because that's that is the issue that we're having. Big biologists they learn uh, they are good in uh, IT technology and then they are being shunted across. I know about four bioinformaticians in London who are doing excellent bioinformatics. Suddenly they've vanished into finance and into uh, into uh, the private sector because they are because they were attracted with about pay about 20 30 times more what than what they get in biology but uh, the uh, if you're interested in science and you have a big passion bioinformatics is a area that is good to have under your belt definitely uh, thank you, sir. And uh, with that, we come to the end of uh, the, uh, the questions from uh, our participants who have registered. And uh, we would now like to open the forum uh, for the participants who are present with us here live. So uh, uh, we invite you to uh, pose your questions uh, on the chat forum, uh, and uh, we will be taking your questions. Uh, there is already one question on the chat box, uh, sir. Uh, this question is, uh, uh, yes, uh, the question is, what happens when the second dose has been delayed? Uh, uh, so uh, I suppose this is regarding um, the efficacy of uh, the vaccine uh, where uh, the second dose has been really delayed. So if you could um, uh, tell us. Uh, yes, yeah, so that was an unfortunate situation where I, it, it occurred over a over a sort of uh, because there was a big vaccine shortage and countries couldn't get vaccines in time and uh, the the important thing is that uh, when we were dealing with the alpha variant etc you found that uh, the immune response you didn't need a very high neutralization response in place but with the omicron variant coming in if your vaccine was delayed then it's important to go and get the third uh, uh, the booster because you want to consolidate that you want to increase the antibody level you want to increase the uh, t-cell responses and cellular responses so especially in a person where the vaccine second vaccine has been delayed so there could be some blunting of the immune response because of that part of that process to go and get the third dose uh, in the recommended period of time at, as we said uh, as we have uh, described now uh, previously and to consolidate and bring that 
response up to a level that is acceptable to neutralize the Omicron variant when you, when you get exposed to it. Good question. Thank you, sir. Um, so we haven't had, uh, we don't have any other questions. So uh, we will be waiting. Uh, we will allow uh, perhaps a few more minutes, uh, maybe uh, maybe one or two minutes. Uh, and uh, we again invite you to uh, post your questions on the chat forum and uh, we will be taking them all if there are any questions. So uh, thank you, Minra, for handling the Q&A session. Uh, I think uh, the UCCS on behalf of... Uh, Rabin, uh, Rabin, I'm sorry to interrupt, uh, but it appears we have a few more questions. Ah, so, yes, uh, yes. We'll take those uh, yes. up I think we'll we have to extend the question session by a few more minutes. Yes. Yes. Sir, before, yes. All right. Okay. Um, so um, so uh, we have two questions. So uh, the question is, what is known about uh, the morbidity and mortality uh, due to uh, Omicron, uh, Omicron uh, the Omicron variant as of now? Um, that is the Yes. Question. So I, I think we, it's very early stages. I mean, if you look at the, if you, if you all have time, just look, read the three articles that were written uh, recently. I can, I mean, you can get a copy from, from the committee about but what is no what was known about uh, the Omicron variant as at that date, and on this, uh, say, another two days' time, and another updated article will come on that. But let me put it in a nutshell. If you look at morbidity, so the data from South Africa was that this was a mild, it was younger people getting a mild infection. That was the initial, initial data. But the, uh, the strange thing was in that same bit of data, they were saying that uh, people were getting to hospital. So there were some younger people with mild infection, but they were getting to hospital. That was a bit unusual. Why should a person with mild infection get into hospital? So the, pan, the, the number of cases increasing in South Africa and a massive increase has occurred. But we, in the UK, again, there were mild infection, but yesterday they are, they are starting to find people getting into hospital with Omicron. And the way the pandemic generally goes is two weeks after something is described or the infection is a new variant, et cetera, you find the hospitalizations coming. And it's only about four weeks after that that the severe uh, complications together with death comes in. So this is still too early. It was only on the 24th of uh, 26th of December that, uh, sorry, 26th of November that this variant was classified as a variant of concerned by the WHO. It's still very, very early. It's only about two and a half weeks. And we still do not know. There was, a, there was some uh, uh, possible suggestion saying from the German, uh, from a German professor saying that, you know, is the Omicron variant mutating, it, mutating itself, right, to make it less uh, dangerous, but being able to spread from person to person. I mean, so that there is a survival benefit, but doesn't cause severe disease in the person and cause them to die. That was a very interesting hypothesis put forward, but that has to be looked and tested. And in the UK, we are starting to see patients get into hospital. And that is an important thing to remember because the neutralization is low. And the important thing to remember is if the number of cases increase and a small proportion of that becomes severe, right? still then hospitals may not be able to cope up with that. Because if you have 1,000 cases and 1% gets severe, the hospitals can cope up. If you have 100,000 patients and 1%, the hospitals may not be able to cope up. So that is the important thing. As transmission increases, you can see more people come to hospital and the hospitals may not be able to cope up if we don't watch that carefully. And that is exactly why 
UK especially is rushing to vaccinate people and give a booster dose. And in Sri Lanka, we have very few, one or two, I think the last time, the number of cases, we have to watch that space because many people are coming into Colombo at the moment, into Sri Lanka. They will be, I mean, Omicron will come, will be transmitted. There's no way that you can uh, stop it because, you know, transfer, yeah, travel is occurring, etc. And the important thing is to ensure that the population is adequately immune to that. So if anybody is not vaccinated, I don't think many people on this forum would be not vaccinated, but if you are not vaccinated, please take the vaccine. And secondly, if you're not got the booster with the Omicron variant coming, think about definitely getting as soon as you're invited. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, so we have yet a few more questions regarding um, uh, the Omicron variant. Uh, so there are two questions which I think we can combine. So uh, one question is regarding the severity of Omicron compared to the Delta variant. And uh, sir, also uh, the question, uh, the second question is, um, uh, yes, uh, so the Omicron uh, variant at the moment is behaving as Shall a I answer the first question? Yes, sir. Shall yes, sir. Yeah. You can so go as it stands, as it stands, two and a half weeks, it, uh, the, the Omicron variant is more transmissible than Delta, definitely. We know that. But the severity of the disease appears to be milder than Delta, but we are early in the phase. And as it goes and more people get affected, more people go into hospital, that might change. So that is, in a nutshell, that is the answer with regards to Omicron and uh, Delta. Uh, yes, sir. So, and uh, the next- Second part of the question, yeah. Yes, uh, uh, second part is, um, so at the moment, Omicron is behaving as a mild disease, uh, assuming uh, the South African scenario plays out globally and it is milder. Uh, is there a possibility that the Omicron variant can mutate into a more severe form? I think as if we don't, what is happening is that variants are arising, especially in areas where sufficient high transmission is occurring for whatever reason. High transmission is occurring either due to social public health measures not being followed or vaccination not being done, etc. You can see, know what happened in India with the Delta variant, right? There was a combination of the, Things. There were lots of people going on festivals, meeting, the vaccination was very low at that stage, and the Delta variant came and just went through like wildfire. Uh, then it came to Sri Lanka, and then it went all over the world. Then you found that uh, in South Africa and Southern Africa, vaccination is 25% had two vaccines. In South Africa, only 7% have had two vaccines since in the whole of Africa. I mean, so that is absolutely low. And if if few countries say we have 80, 90% vaccination and, and are flying our flag and are very happy, that is going to backfire because a variant, another variant will come, 50 mutations in the Omicron variant, 32 in the spike protein. Many, many changes are there. At least now we think that some of the T cell responses may be preserved because some of the T cell epitopes are not. The Look at Nigeria. And as a result, there's a lot of transmission because there are no the other measures are not followed. And if that happens, a new variant arises, somebody finds it, they travel around. I mean, how much can you close the airports, et cetera? Why they closed the airports ex for, uh, uh, recently was to get some time. You can't, you, can't, you can't control a pandemic by closing the airports and preventing travel. People will travel, but you just got some that the British government did that just to get some time to be able to know what this variant is because now there are in the uk there's more omicron than in, in several other countries so you can't you know you can't be closing your ports for indefinitely because you know trade has to occur economy 
uh, the, of the countries has to take place. So four pillars should be going on, public health measures and vaccination hand in hand, so those are two main pillars to ensure that this doesn't go out of control. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, so it appears that there aren't any more questions on the chat forum. Um, so we have one more question. Uh, so, so this is uh, regarding, uh, yes, uh, sir, could you uh, give us your thoughts regarding herd immunity? And uh, if you could uh, add, yes, your thoughts on herd immunity and COVID-19 in the context of uh, the UK government's plan A for the winter, which is uh, basically to persevere without restrictions. Uh, so uh, if you could. Uh, yeah, so now we are in plan B, now we're going into plan C most likely, right, in the UK. So the plan A was sometimes. So, I mean, we have to balance, you know, when it comes to a politician, the medics will be telling one thing, the the uh, the business is telling one thing the travel sector is telling one thing so they have to weigh up a lot of things we have to take that you know this we are not we have to take health in one aspect you have to take the economy because if you the economy fails and the economy goes down people are going to have starvation i mean other issues can occur which are also may, can lead to health problem so when you when initially the ish thing was Delta variant, some control, good vaccination, et cetera. They, they relaxed the measures, but then when Omicron came in, they had to change that. Initially, they, they, they were quite fast compared to Delta because Delta, they, they delayed quite a bit. So they quickly brought in some measures, but they found that despite those measures, the transmissibility was high. So what did they do? They went into level b now we're in level b and level uh, the b b uh, category and we may have to go into level c for at least a short period and then come out of it uh, uh, quickly out of out of that because it's a balance between travel economy health uh, etc and one of the ways to try and help this process and not try to have to close too many uh, sectors because that's not good in, uh, for for the population overall is to you know get some immunity get adequate immunity using a booster dose the herd immunity concept i think i've spoken i wanted to put a slide on herd immunity that was a we thought of it previously you know if you can vaccinate a certain amount of population but with the new variants that that threshold is increasing and increasing. So I think we should not get too, too uh, sort of uh, carried away with herd immunity, et cetera, at this stage. I think the most important is to get as many people immune so that even if they get an infection, they get mild infection, rather than looking at these different terms like herd immunity, et cetera, at this present state and balance the responses, medical responses, health responses, Responses, economic responses, travel responses have to be balanced and personal response. You have a personal duty of care. You as an individual have a care to yourself and to other people because what you do impacts not only yourself, it impacts other people. So if, if people take responsibility together, it's collective, that is how, and that is how things can be brought under control. Uh, thank you, sir. And with that, uh, we uh, conclude uh, the Q&A session. Uh, and I would like to hand over the session to uh, Ravi uh, so that uh, he can conclude uh, the mid talk for today. Thank you, Minra. Uh, I think that was a very informative and uh, wonderful mid talk and a timely topic that was delivered by Professor Suranjit and I, on behalf of uh, Team UCCS and all of the participants here, I would like to sincerely thank Professor Suranjit for agreeing to host this talk for us. And uh, with that, ladies and gentlemen, we would like to conclude the final Med Talk for the year 2021. And we hope to see you next year with many more interesting and timely topics on medicine and beyond. A very good evening to you all and thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thanks a lot.